Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. This is gone neat. Well, That's this is a much long awaited presentation. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Our story begins in Purdue, at Purdue University in West Lafayette in 1980 at the Pi Beta Phi Women's Sorority. Uh, that's their uh, sorority house. Um, Pi Beta Phi Sorority is one is the oldest uh, sorority in um, in America, first uh, female sorority. Uh, the Delta chapter uh, uh, is at Purdue, and that means it's the fourth chapter in Indiana that was established. It was established in 1921. My wife, my future wife, Charlotte, pledges, pledged the Pi Beta Phi in her sophomore year in college and moved to into the sorority house at borders of Purdue campus. And Little of Lowell, Indiana is also in her sophomore year at Purdue, but her in, in her second year in sorority, having pledged as a freshman. Anne's family were farmers during the summers while in college. She would return to Lowell and help on work on the farm. Fast forward to 2021. The, the Delta, Delta chapter of uh, Pi Beta Phi is celebrating its 100th anniversary at, per, at Purdue. And my wife volunteers to hold, head up the uh, silent auction and begin to solicit donations from Pi Beta Phi alumni. Charlotte contacts her former sorority roommates, including Ann Little, who is now living in Berlin with her husband, Tim, and two of their children. And graciously donates a week's stay in the garden home of the outskirts of Berlin. She also includes a personal tour of the new James Simon Gallery, an entrance pavilion on Museum Island in the Mitte section of Berlin. This is the first one of the email exchanges that we had uh, with Anne trying to uh, work things out. Uh, well, uh, Char bids on the uh, uh, package and, and wins the silent auction package. And uh, we were scheduled to. Um, have Thanksgiving dinner with them and also go to um, tour Berlin uh, since of course Germany doesn't have a Thanksgiving as we know it. Um, they said there were going to be uh, some interesting, some of our guests include the advisor of the Prime Minister for Defense and Foreign Affairs of Holland, his ex-wife who does very interesting work for the Netherlands as well as their daughter, the former German ambassador to the U.S. and his wife who is from Egypt two men from Hong Kong who own a villa north and, of there and, uh, and has an amazing sculpture garden and, and rotating art exhibits, probably a Dutch artist and other uh, interesting people. Of course, we, when we read that, we were that incredibly uh, um, uh, nervous about going and uh, meeting all these people and that, uh, just being a lowly architect from Indianapolis. And so, and also sends a picture, a photo of the grand opening ceremonies of the gallery. And look who, there's Anne and Tim in the middle. And look who's on the right side there. It's Angela Merkel. So we, we started realizing that this was going to be a big deal. This, uh, this uh, pavilion, this uh, gallery that they named in honor of Anne's husband's uh, great, great uncle. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic cancels nearly all travel to Germany as well as most of the Christmas markets that year. The trip will have to wait. Now we come to December 2022 and uh, we finally get, we'll be going to Berlin. Instead of us staying there in the garden house, Anne has made arrangements for us to stay at a swanky hotel in the historic Mitte section of Berlin. Unfortunately, we were a little intimidated by the fact that it's called the Titanic Hotel. <laughs> and, uh, wh wh why that? Why we uh, have that? Why I was so in, had trepidation about that? Our flight in uh, over to Germany that uh, that December was, uh, was uh, wrought with was fraught with uh, um, problems. Um, my wife and I um, had to get up and go to the airport early in the morning. And I have Parkinson's and I had my uh, medicine sitting there right on the corner of the kitchen table. And we raced out of the t uh, house, got in, you know, got over to the uh, airport. And 20 minutes before we were ready to leave, I realized I'd forgotten my medication. And having Parkinson's, that's a bad, bad situation. My wife has, didn't talk to me for the whole flight pretty much. 
um, we had to come up with a, um, a way to, for me to get the uh, medication. I asked my brother Don to mail it to me, but uh, overnight, which was going to cost a ton of money, but that you can't overnight uh, mail, mail uh, you can't mail medications. Well, let's just say I was slightly homicidal for about two hours on that flight. <laughs> we also had problems with the flight. Because I had, the I had mentioned many times before that to please pack them ahead of time. I know all the women in the room understand what I'm saying. <laughs> well, when, when we were on the airport, the airplane, um, we had no lighting in the, in the cabin and we had all the power was down. And there was one light that was on. It was blinking uh, and it was over our uh, two seats and uh, it was driving us crazy. We had to uh, read. There was no uh, movies that we could watch or anything. We just heard a crying baby most of the time. And uh, we had to use our phone, cell phones to uh, read anything. And uh, we asked it, why can we just uh, turn off that blinking light? They said if that happened, then uh, all the rest of the power would go off in the the, the generator power in the uh, cabin. So, so for every we, every three minutes, that light would flash on and off above our our seats. So when we got to Berlin and realized we were going to be at the Titanic Hotel, I thought that's a, that's a bad omen. <laughs> but it was very nice. We were uh, situated. Let me back up a minute, Ron. Um, the Titanic um, and my friend Ann runs in big circles now and the reason she hooked us up at that hotel is because she's friends with the owner <laughs> so she thought they would yeah. really do us a good favor there so i don't know if you see my cursor or maybe you don't the, yeah the, the, do. the, the, the hotel here right here is uh where the titanic hotel is oops let me go back the dimita is listed right in here somewhere right there Mita, meaning of course the middle or the downtown area um, right over here, the Spray River separates, and I'll go to the next slide. It, it creates an island uh, in the river, and they call that Museum Island. And uh, there's a, there's the old museum, the new museum, which the old one I think was built in 1824. The new one was in 1864 or something like that. So the new museum is really not that new. And then there's the Pergamon Museum and there's some other Berliner Dome. Uh, so uh, we were gonna take a tour of that. And in this area right here was where the Simon Gallery was built. This is a aerial view of the, the island. And you can see it's very packed with uh, buildings. Uh, I wanted to show you that we were actually there because uh, here's here I am standing at the base of the uh, stairs, but these, it was, I overcast and dark and I have to say that you know going to Berlin which is several longitude or latitudinal degrees north of Indianapolis it, it didn't get light until especially in the December early December didn't get light out until eight something and, and it was pitch black by four o'clock in the afternoon so it was cold and dark and uh, I didn't get very good uh, pictures so I'm going to I'm going to cheat and I'm going to take some pictures off the internet of the of the uh, Simon Gallery. It, it didn't look like the, it didn't bright wasn't this bright when, when when we were there, but you could see that it's a, a very modern uh, design uh, next to a very classical um, building. That's I think that's a new new museum. As you can see, it's not new like I said. And here's uh, some more uh, draw, uh, photographs of the exterior. It's very, very uh, contemporary, very minimalistic, but it's a beautiful uh, design. Here it is at night. The, um, the colonnade and it, it wraps around here. And here's basically the, the pavilion is, um, uh, is built, was built similar to um, um, I.M. Pei's uh, pyramidal entrance to the Louvre where they needed a they had the old museum and the new museum or actually the Pergamon oops the Pergamon uh, museum and the all older new new I guess new museum needed a new entrance and uh, they needed a, a, a gift shop uh, a 
traveling exhibit hall, a bookstore, uh, a dining area. So that was what was you developed in this design here. And uh, it, the interior is a beautiful uh, and a minimalistic uh, sense. Uh, here are some uh, uh, interior shots. You can see the uh, auditorium, they have an auditorium. Uh, this is exhibit space. Uh, they have, uh, I think this might be um, a gift shop or something. Now, who was James Simon? That, that he has his name on this building. <laughs> and it was uh, Ann and Tim Simon. How are they connected with that? with this whole project. James Simon, which is the first name was actually Henry, was born in 1851 and lived to be uh, 80, 81 years old, was a German businessman in Berlin during the Wilhelmine era, patron of the Berlin museums, and founder and financier of numerous charitable institutions. Simon was Jewish as uh, his father, Isaac, was a tailor who had gone to Berlin in 1838. He quickly became wealthy with a men's wardrobe shop, then with a cotton intermediary company founded in 1852 with his brother, Louis. The impetus, this is incredible. The impetus for the family's truly great wealth was from the historic event overseas, the American Civil War, during which the export of cotton to Europe came to a standstill. In Prussia, there was a cotton crisis as well. The Simon brothers were able to sell their large stock at five times the price. They, so they got into selling cotton at, during the Civil War. The company grew rapidly and from the 1870s until the beginning of the First World War, World War the most, they were the most important cotton company in Europe. Oops. What, uh, what he's most famous for is the, after he got uh, wealthy and he was uh, donating to charitable institutions like uh, orphanages and, and such, he had got into uh, collecting Renaissance paintings. He uh, sold those, or at least I think donated donated much of those to the uh, Berlin Museum, the Altus Museum. And then he got into uh, Egyptian archaeology. Uh, yes, he started to uh, fund um, uh, excavations in Egypt, and. In 1913, well, he started the ex he hired, of course, an ex uh, archaeologist. And in 1911, he started they started excavating. In 1913, they found this beautiful sculpture of Nefertiti, which was dated to 3500 BC. Now think about that. Egypt was they they know who the sculptor is, Tutmose. They know uh, who she's married to. She was probably 16 when she got married. This is a bust. This is probably you know, it's considered the most beautiful bust of a woman, similar to the um, uh, Mona Lisa as a paint, you know, in the painting realm. Um, 3500 BC, w Egypt was in power. It was a major player in the world powers for 3500 years until before the Christ was born or the, the turn of the Christian. Uh, switch to uh, 3,500 years. 2,200 years ago was when Cleopatra lived. So we are closer to Cleopatra than Nefertiti was to Cleopatra. That's how long Egypt has been in in a, in the civilized uh, world. So this this statue, this bust, was found in. Um, many layers of um, rock or, or, or I guess or, uh, soil. And uh, because James Simon was the only um, benefit, benefactor to fund the uh, excavation, he became the owner of this beautiful sculpture and became very famous. So currently that, that uh, bust is housed in the uh, Alta Museum. Um, James Simon, uh, there's been a lot of books written about James Simon. Um, he was, um, he was a, one of the wealthiest, most influential men in Berlin's history. 
And unfortunately, he died in 1932, which was a year before Hitler came to power and uh, started destroying all the Jew Jewish businesses and killing, uh, sending the Jews to concentration camps. So he was, um, he had already donated the bust of Nefertiti to the uh, museum at Berlin. So it was already in the uh, hands of the uh, G German uh, museum officials when the war broke out. It, it did get uh, sent to, um, I can't remember where it was, but they, they hid it in a, uh, a, a, a remote place until the war was over. It was um, many of the, the uh, uh, Simons um, donated uh, artwork and things were part of the whole monuments man uh, uh, f uh, disaster <laughs> where um, they were uh, taken and hidden. But the, uh, the, the Nefertiti statue is uh, luckily was uh, not uh, um, destroyed or lost. Um, David Chipperfield was the architect of the um, of the design, and um, he won a uh, because of the, on the strength of his design for the building, um, he became he was granted the uh, highest honor in architecture, which is the Pritzker Prize, and uh, that was this uh, in February of this year. Um, so. Uh, that the design is well has been well received. Um, Sharon, her uh, roommate, our uh, previous sorority sister, uh, had a fun time reconnecting in um, in Germany. Um, there was a we don't know what, where this picture came from. <laughs> it looks like something monumental or uh, was happening, and we were. Char is like racing off to wherever Anne's pointing to, but we have no idea when that was taken and why we were in such a, a hurry. Um, the interior of the um, uh, Altus Museum was also designed by, um, was, uh, was a part of the re restoration of the building. And it's amazing how um, beautiful uh, the uh, rest, restoration or renovations uh, turned out. There's uh, these rooms are made up of uh, masonry, oops, masonry uh, bricks and stones that were um, uh, re, re, uh, rebuilt. Uh, it, it's just a beautiful uh, with the skylight and uh, of course there's exhibits down here now. Uh, it's it's just a beautiful um, design. Um, there's the uh, the museum Neues Museum. Uh, you can see the um, galleries and the uh, how it's laid out. These are the um, the two rooms that have skylights here, uh, obviously, right here and here. So um, the the whole experience of going into from the uh, the new gallery into the um, new noise museum was a much better flow, and you don't even know when you're in one and out of it out of the other. So uh, there, there are some other uh, pictures. I, I'm, I'm going to go through this because I'm, I'm not uh, finished with this part of it. But there's some uh, other photos of um, now Berlin. I, I was curious as to what where the wall was in Berlin. And right here is the meta. So the wall snaked around uh, this downtown area, or this middle area, and um, I, it almost looks like how the Great Wall of China uh, goes in and out. And I thought they probably took a straight shot, but they they really uh, moved it around uh, to to um, um, get one one particular building or whatever into the, uh, one side or the other. Here's those. Uh, okay. The Neues Museum, uh, there's a picture of it. So anyway, we we um, had dinner in the, uh, or uh, I guess lunch in the uh, restaurant part of the uh, um, 
James Simon Museum. We were also accompanied by Char's niece and her boyfriend. Um, Kelsey is um, fluent in Ger German and Japanese and was our uh, guide when uh, Anne was not our guy. Anne. And, uh, yes, um, Kelsey actually has dual citizenship. And then the other woman sitting in front of Ron also is in charge of all the volunteers that work at the James Simon Gallery. And um, to be a volunteer at the James Simon Gallery, you have to do an internship there for two years. So there's extensive training to, in order to do that. But what was so impressive is Kelsey already knew most of what the other uh, docents and uh, ex exhibit uh, leaders already had to study for. She was amazing in her knowledge. Um, I'm going to go through. Okay, here's David Chipperfield receiving the Pritzker Award. And uh, like I said, if you go to David Chipperfield uh, website, he, he's he got the um, ga gallery as his number one um, design uh, because that's what put him over, I think, in the, as a leader of the, as a favorite for the Pritzker Prize. Um, I, I'm, I wanted this to be part of uh, the presentation, but I was uh, lost uh, time and I apologize, but I'm going to do a, go through this and well here we, we also, um, Char took uh, advantage of the uh, Chris Kindle Mark and the uh, um, um, flea the, markets, antique flea, flea markets. Market. And yeah. Anne, Anne drove us everywhere. I mean, it's unusual kind of to have a car there, but she, um, she did have a car and she just was the most amazing host and she's become very familiar with the area. So she took us to all the, off the tourist trap sections of this town, Charlotte, Charlottensburg and different things like that. Yeah. Um, here's a, more information about, uh, so anyway, mo most of what, uh, you know, um, Berlin was destroyed in, um, uh, in the uh, during the war, and they had to um, either rebuild uh, or fix up the uh, buildings. Um, and there's been an ongoing, um, let me go through here, ongoing uh, um, discussion on what you know. What should they build? Rebuild? Do they rebuild buildings that? Um, you know, from some from the ground up, rebuild them in a modern text in context, or uh, um, or you know exactly like it was, or partly like it was. This is the uh, palace, the Berlin Palace. This was completely rebuilt on the left side, and uh, it forms a quadrangle, and so the three sides are, I think, three sides are uh, historic looking, but the fourth side is very modern, it keeps the uh, rhythm of the windows, but it's obviously obvious that the, uh, the building is, is a new uh, adaptation of what was there before. Um, the palace, the people questioned why the palace was even gonna be built because they had, they had no use. And it was also the third, it was gonna be the third uh, building on the site that, um, the, the original palace was destroyed in, like I said, in the World War II. Then the communists took it over and built a um, very modern building. And when uh, reunification came about, they, they tore that down and there was a parking lot for a while. And then they said, we want to rebuild that. And, uh, but they had no use for the building. So they finally found a use for it and built it. But people are saying, why are we spending all this money to recreate buildings that have been destroyed? Um, and they have, you know, it's a good, it's a good argument. I'm going to go through a couple. I've took it, taken uh, some uh, pictures out of the, this book, which is Berlin then and now, or then and today. Um, here's the, uh, the total destruction of Berlin in 1945. There's the Brandenburg Gate down below. Uh, you can see there's not much left of in, uh, in, uh, as a whole. Um, only you see this church spires here. Um, and is, this is similar to what you see in Ukraine, unfortunately. And uh, I, I worry about how uh, Ukraine is going to come uh, back from its uh, 
all this destruction. But, you know, when you look at the total destruction that happened during World War II, you know, in places like Dresden, Berlin, Cologne, et cetera, et cetera, France, and, uh, you know, it, it has re rebounded. And I, I hope the same for Ukraine. Uh, the, um, it was the policy of the communist state that forget the past, build something quick and functional. And when they re, re, uh, became uh, um, uh, uh, when they absorbed, uh, well, and when they became part of the communist, when East Germany and East Berlin became part of the communist state, they the communists didn't have any uh, use for historic buildings. They were very uh, utilitarian and functional. Um, you know, Berlin, it's interesting, even today, Berlin is, has no tall buildings. I mean, there's no skyscrapers. They're all, everything's about five stories tall. Uh, it's very um, blue collar or kind of gritty. I wouldn't say it's a, the most beautiful. Um, utilitarian, more utilitarian. Yeah, utilitarian. yeah it's very uh, um, industrial. Um, you know, I, I've made two trips to Germany prior to that, and I did the whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, typical uh, uh, tourist attractions like Neuschwanstein and uh, Romantic Road and the Rhine River, and et cetera, et cetera. But it was interesting to go to Berlin and see an actual, uh, you know, labor town, uh, industrial town. Um, and also, in how they, um, you know, how they preserved or the memory. There was, you know, there were a couple of ruins like this where they left it standing as a memorial to what was there before. Um, oh, anyway, so I, there, there's different ways that um, they've come to preserve their, their, uh, their history, and uh, with the. Um, James Simon Gallery, um, the, the one, the, the, their solution at the museum on Museum Island was to build something new and sh uh, shiny and bright. And uh, but there's other uh, solutions that uh, are, are valid, like rebuilding what's partially uh, what was there before in memory of what was you know some of the beautiful. Like uh, we were in the John Gendarme. Uh, area of the Mitte. It's, it's a very high class, expensive area of the of the Berlin. And we were right beside the um, concert hall that was destroyed. Uh, there's, a, there's a concert hall and then there's two cathedrals, one a uh, German cathedral and a French cathedral side by side uh, of the uh, concert hall. And they were completely destroyed in World War II. And then the, in the 1980s, they decided to rebuild it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see how, um, you know, how they want to rebuild buildings that, you know, have been gone for 80 years now. And, you know, there's very few people that remember those buildings when they were vital and uh, original. And now, you know, decades later and generations later, people still want to have that as part of their history. And I wanted to do mention too, um, there's always, uh, getting back to the, uh, um, I want to discuss this perhaps, um, the whole uh, issue about Egyptian um, artifacts in, in Berlin. It, Berlin, is, it, with the uh, assistance of um, James Simon, has the most uh, Egyptian artifacts i think in the world and there's always that discussion is why why do you have why does berlin have all these egyptian artifacts shouldn't they be in egypt um the, if the, the, he obviously paid for the excavation or you know he uh, he um, um documented it throughout the process it was all above board but um there are people that think that it's it, uh, it's a travesty that all those Egyptian artifacts are 
outside of Egypt. Um, Germans say that uh, it's more like an uh, ambassadorship. Queen Nefertiti is the ambassador from Egypt to the German people. Um, but I, you know, it, because we're so Eurocentric and Western centric, we don't really bat an eye, most of us that, you know, see all these Egyptian artifacts in a, in a Western uh, museum. But think about what if all these, United, what if they, uh, like say Chile or I'm just picking a name, you know, Australia, what if they had a, all these beautiful artifacts from the United States? You know, wouldn't that seem odd? And I'm just wondering, you know, what uh, my, my question is, well, what do you think of that whole um, artifact um, being in a, from a, in a different country? Uh, there is some validity to it, but I think uh, for the most part, people accept it. So that's my presentation, but I, I would like to entertain some uh, comments. And Ron, uh, yes. I'd like you to mention something about in, in I think it's a new museum where that one exhibition hall had um, the bullet hole still in the walls. Yeah, yeah. Did you mention that about how they yeah. chose to retain that and not to not to disguise that at all? Yeah, that, that yeah. My my expanded uh, presentation that I didn't get, like I said, didn't get to is how how is Berlin uh, preserving their history? Um, you know, they have, you know, they've gone through a horrific twelve years of uh, Nazi rule. And then they, uh, East Germany uh, was under the uh, thumb of uh, socialism and communism for so long. There was a story that uh, Kelsey's boyfriend said about the, his dad or grandfather, I can't remember what it was, was a soldier during the communist uh, rule, uh, ruling of uh, East Germany. And he was uh, uh, in the work in the motor pool or, uh, yeah. And uh, there was a, they worked uh, on the airport airplanes and there was a incident where the pilot was taking off and, uh, and then, uh, slow, you know, um, I guess breaking or I don't know if you break or, you know, power down and this um, hammer a wrench wrench flew in and almost killed the uh, pilot uh, flew out of the uh, back. And so they, um, they called all the people in the uh, mechanics room and said, whoever is responsible for this will be shot on site. And uh, they said, come back in two hours and with your equipment. So Kelsey's boyfriend's father, grandfather pleaded with his coworkers. Well, first, they, they wanted him to bring their equipment back to show who was missing that wrench. Yes, yeah. So they came up with it. They found a, a new wrench and they beat it into beat it on it, you know, try to make it look um, old and used. And so they didn't find the person, luckily, they didn't identify him. But that's, you know, that's the kind of suppression that uh, East Germany lived under during the communist rule, uh, you know, just as um, bloodthirsty as other um, dictatorships. Um, so it was Berlin, the, the trip from Berlin was very educational. It made me think about um, how, you know, how a city that's gone through two epics of uh, horrific, or three perhaps, if you talk about World War I, uh, horrific um, life and uh, how they decide to. Uh, remember those those uh, eras you know for so long they didn't want to talk about it uh, and that's very understandable um, but there's they're starting to uh, um, come to grips with that that era in their lot in their history so as an um, aside too I want to mention something about um, when Ron said that he forgot his medicine to put that in perspective and not to be too personal but for Ron to function all to you know at his best and to enjoy the trip, he would have needed 104 pills for that week. And he forgot all of those. 
my niece happened to have a doctor's appointment the very next day or the day that we arrived and she took us with them. We explained everything to the doctor, showed the doctor photographs of the prescription bottles and we got all of his, all of his prescriptions except one written for the week as well as that doctor's con consultation and we were never charged a thing for any of it. I think we were charged $10 for the doctor's appointment. A 15, I think it was. But when we got the uh, medication at the drugstore. It was all free. It, well, I I, uh, I I had to order it. They, they It was just a little apothecary shop. And the, the uh, uh, pharmacist, and she looked like she'd been working a long year, a long time. <laughs> she was worn out. She said, come back the next day around 10 o'clock or whatever. And I got there at 9.30 or 9.50. And I said, or it was my medication. And she was, I told you it'd be 10 o'clock. You know, she got real mad. And, uh, you know, but I, when I went to pay for it, she said, oh, it's already been paid. Oh, okay, okay. And I, I look on my credit card statements and I didn't see any indication where I'd paid it. So that whole incident only cost me $15, but it but also it cost me. But it was a really neat experience seeing how their medical system worked. I mean, going to the doctor's office was, almost like going to a back alley abortion clinic or something. It was sort of seedy and, but it was, that's just how they run it. And it was very helpful to us. We couldn't have gotten through the week without it. So. Yeah. I'm but it was a real, it was an interesting experience seeing all the um, historical star stuff of Germany and off also seeing what the life is like for a friend of mine who had left the United States to live in Germany. Her home, of course, is um, by their standards, most people don't own a home there. And her home that they own is wonderful and, you know, very wonderful for entertaining. But outside of her front door are the, what are they called, Ron? Memory brick or um, memorial stones or something. The memorial, I can't remember what they're called, but there are stones embedded in the sidewalk in front of the home. Pardon me? Yes, indicating who had lived there before and had been taken away by the Nazis. So that was a very sobering reminder of, you know, the changes that have taken place. But I, I like that they do that to still keep those places belonging to the people who originally owned them. So any questions yeah. for Ron? For sure. Yeah, Ron. What exhibits are in that um, particular museum at this point? Is it all the Egyptian? Say that again, you're kind of. The, the exhibits in that museum, what are they? Is it Egyptian? Yeah, yeah. Egyptian, the, uh, the Noyes Museum. But the in the in the Simon Gallery, which introduces you to all the other museums, they have a rotating, they have rotating exhibits of um, both past and current artists. So they do openings for current artists too that are well respected. So it's it's a very um, live, what? interactive. Yeah. They do a lot of social um, social events there, introducing new artists and. Um, so it's a great way of continuing the support of the arts in that area. They had the um, an exhibit. It was a temporary or, you know, several months long, but it, uh, exhibit from on Heinrich Schliemann, which is the archaeologist for uh, Troy. And uh, my brother Don and I became very interested in Schliemann back in the mid 80s when we watched uh, a program on PBS. That was, uh, well, that was our first introduction to Heinrich Schliemann. He has, uh, I'm, I'm sure we've had some pro, uh, presentations or programs about Heinrich Schliemann. He actually spent some time in Indianapolis and uh, I think he dated somebody here for a few months or something, Or, but he did spend several months in uh, Indianapolis. And that would be a, if we haven't done it, I, I, I would recommend a program on Heinrich Schliemann. So Bill, have we ever done one on Heinrich Schliemann? Uh, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Well, don't ask me to ask Don. I don't want to have to go through this whole half hour wait again. And I apologize so much for that. He, so. he, came, he came to Indianapolis because we had quickie divorce laws back then. Okay. We were the <laughs> Las Vegas of the 1800s. 
Well, I hope you I hope you've enjoyed our little trip to uh, Berlin. Next time I go, if I go, it's going to be in June where the light is uh, out late and, uh, and warm weather. Yes, yes. I saw a picture which you did not address or talk about, the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtnis which is a church where only the tower in the entry wall uh, was left standing, and the new tiny modern church is built around it. It's kind of a new building. Was but that one of the pictures that he showed? That, I yes. agree through that. Um, yes, that was that was phenomenal. That. That was, was, that was. I think that was in Charlottenburg, wasn't it? It's, it was close. The um, that's uh, Kaiser Kaiser Wilhelm's uh, church. That was an evangelical church. It was built for Kaiser Wilhelm in 1890. I think in 1896. And uh, I wanted to include that in the slides, but I I, I didn't have. Highly time. recommend going to that. That was very moving and and. Um, juxtaposition of that. Traditional church and the completely new church, while the altar is kind of in the middle. I remember that vividly. That I thought it was understanding yeah. how the old and the new what, came what, together in the state of. What I found interesting was that. The build the church is built in 1896, I believe. So it's a, you know it's fairly new when when it was destroyed in 19. I mean it was only less than 50 years old. But what I found interesting about the murals that were painted in that uh, it's the basically the uh, vestibule or the entrance area to the church. There were all these murals about war and how um, the German people you know won these wars and battles with God's assistance, you know, and I, I felt, you know, God would not like that, um, you know, being associated with uh, winning a war. I don't think there's any very few holy wars. And, uh, you know, so, so this was, it was interesting that there, you know, and right next to it, they built a very modern tower and very modern design. So, you know, within a span of like 80 years, we had, we go from a, very traditional uh, evangelical uh, church, you know, with all the bells and whistles and pomp and circumstance of a, of a um, Victorian era, a Wilhelmina era uh, design to a, something that's very um, contemporary. And, uh, you know, when, when I went into the contemporary uh, tower, it was very moving. I mean, you know, to see how, it was the, the number of people that were still coming to visit that and to pray. Um, it was a very, I mean, I saw people crying and I, I may have been one of them. So I, I could pull that up maybe. Let me see. Yes, to reshare because I took a share. I, Ron, I took your share down. Okay. Because it was showing up black. So, okay. Well, I'll. I'll... Put that picture into the next newsletter. I have one at home. You can't find it quickly. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Anything else? Anybody else have a question? I just have one. You, you mentioned uh, from that. All of Simon's art was in the museum prior to the Nazis rising to power. And so, because he was Jewish, of course, we know that a lot of Jewish art had been taken by the Nazis and spread all over Europe. Are there any other uh, are there any other pieces in the museum that would have been sent there or that would have been involved in? Nazi stealing of from Jews during that time. Um, like I, 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 you know, I'm sure there was um, all kinds of different uh, scenarios that uh, all this uh, artifacts and artwork and 
uh, what happened to it and how it was lost and now it's uh, been reclaimed. You know, I, I happened to list, be listening to N, uh, NPR uh, a few weeks ago and they were talking about how, what the uh, current status is of, of artifacts. If up until, not, if, if, if they were, uh, you know, uh, if they were legally purchased and they never were uh, stolen, and, you know, it, it goes back to whoever made that last uh, purchase, val valid purchase. But things have changed uh, since 1970, and there are new rules about, um, pro, uh, you know, who is actually own, own or can uh, claim um, um, ownership. I mean, there's, there was, a, I think, a big story about, uh, was it a Gustav Klimt? Uh, uh, the, yes, a new exhibit in California, right? Yes, I was just going to say that in the movie, the woman in gold. Is yeah, that's the, beautiful. The, yeah. The that you claim it said at the end there are still a hundred thousand pieces of art that were taken by the Nazis from Jews that are they haven't found. They don't. And they're not the ones that they haven't been able to get back. There are 100,000 elements of where they are. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah, a myth. Right. I mean, you know, there's there's so many layers of, you know, ownership that people claim, you know, uh, you know, the Jews, if they took it from Egypt, it's not really theirs. If the Germans took it from the Jews and they had, Jews don't have any right to it. Um, it's, you know, it's multi-layered and uh, difficult to sift through. They have to uh, claim the, you know, provenance and follow it through and all those pieces that, uh, that were taken. Uh, it's a, it's a, a huge amount that I, it requires a lot of investigation, but luckily the Germans consider the uh, Nefertiti sculpture uh, one of their prized artifacts in, the, in all of Europe, in all of Germany and Europe. So they took care of it. And uh, luckily for James Simon, he, uh, de you know, donated it to the German uh, museum just prior to his death and prior to the Hitler coming into power. So they took care of it because it was so special to them. Um, they were very proud of that. And uh, maybe that is one little small inkling of humanity that the Nazis showed um, and throughout their whole horrific r rule. So anyway, anything else? And then uh, with that, Ron, I don't think uh, the German museums will ever see the things that Stalin has. Stalin took at the, during the, at the end of the war. I don't think Putin will give those things back. Yeah. <laughs> don't get me started on Putin. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Ron. And this is just a reminder, a reminder to uh, folks here and those listening at home. Um, we are now having a Stammtisch in July, but we'll resume on the 8th of August. We'll be at German Park and it will be serenaded by the Indianapolis Leader Franz German Band. And then September 13th, we'll have students' presentations, students who have received uh, scholarships from the Indiana German Heritage Society. And uh, also, uh, in uh, October 11th is the next Stammtisch, and we're still debating if that's going to be on Christmas traditions, or if it'll be for a report on uh, the uh, Congress Bundestag, a student, a high school student from Mitchell, Indiana, who's been in Germany for a year on this very prestigious program. And, and that, uh, so that's either October 11th or the 8th of November, and then on the 13th of December, we'll be enjoy ourselves very much singing our favorite Christmas music out Deutsch at the uh, Carmel Chris Kindle March. And that, that'll, that'll finish up our program. Thank you very much for attending and those listening at home. Uh, and we'll uh, see you then again in August. Thank you.
Stock. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, uh, we have German Life magazines here. Sorry about those listening. Oh, I can't and this, this very interesting articles, many of them are, are Texas Germans and also the inflation, the crippling inflation period in Germany, the 20s. So I have a couple of copies here. And if you're not a member of the Indiana Journal here, I'm going to say, please join. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. It was good.